Hello, good evening. My name is Sven de Keizer and welcome to the second part of our neuroradiology summer school dedicated to imaging of brain tumors. Today we are going to continue with imaging of brain tumors in adult patients. Um, could somebody maybe give me a quick sign in the chat room that you can hear me okay. Okay, thank you very much, already done. So that can so then we can jump right into it. So what did we see last time? The last session was dedicated entirely to intraaxial brain tumors in adult patients. And we discussed cerebral metastasis, glioblastoma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, but one is missing, one we didn't discuss yet, it's not as frequent as some of these other tumors, but it's definitely worthy of being included in uh, this session, and that is central nervous system lymphoma. So what can we tell about central nervous system lymphoma? First of all, it's not as frequent as some of the other tumors. On this chart, you see the most frequent malignant brain tumors in adult patients. And as you can see, the majority of these tumors are part of the glioma family, with glioblastoma taking up almost half of the tumors. Nevertheless, if we consider the gliomas one group, then central nervous system lymphomas are the second most common malignant primary brain tumors in adults after gliomas. So they're definitely a tumor you should know. And luckily, it's a tumor with some very characteristic imaging features, making it a very grateful tumor for radiologists because it's one we can pretty easily recognize and diagnose. Let's start with a short introduction on central nervous system lymphoma. What is it? It can be metastatic. You can have secondary and primary central nervous system lymphoma. A secondary uh, central nervous system lymphoma occurs in a patient with systemic lymphoma in which the lymphoma metastasizes to the brain, as we can see here on these nice drawings. Then we have, of course, the primary central nervous system lymphoma in which the patient only has lymphoma in the brain. But this is admittedly a bit bizarre because, as you all know, normally there are no lymphocytes in the brain. So how could you develop a primary lymphoma in the brain that has not metastasized from elsewhere in the body? There are several theories, and I'm just going to go very briefly into that because I find that kind of stuff interesting to know. The first theory is there is no true primary lymphoma. Probably this patient had a systemic lymphoma, but of microscopic size, all very small microscopic herds of pathological lymphocytes or malignant lymphocytes that metastasize to the brain. But this microscopic lymphoma gets detected by our immune system and gets eradicated very rashly, with one exception in the brain because the brain is what we call an immunological safe haven. The brain is protected from the normal immune reaction uh, by the blood-brain barrier, and that is to protect the brain because immunological reactions can cause a lot of collateral damage to an organ. That is why the brain is relatively safeguarded against our immune system. That's the first hypothesis. The second one is that something occurs in the brain, an autoimmune disease or some kind of infection that elicits an immunological reaction. B lymphocytes get recruited and migrate to the brain to deal with whatever is going on there. And then they stay there and eventually undergo malignant transformation. So two theories. And it's just interesting to know, it doesn't really help us as radiologists, but you can never know too much. 
So that's how we can potentially develop a primary central nervous system lymphoma. And what kind of patients do we see uh, this uh, brain tumor? Typically and somewhat older patients. I may have exaggerated a bit by giving this patient a cane, but patients are generally like in their 50s or older. So that also means that the differential diagnosis will be with those kind of tumors that are most frequent and this age group, and what is that? In elder adults, that's mainly cerebral metastasis and glioblastoma. Uh, where can we have a central nervous system lymphoma? In what compartments of the brain? Central nervous system lymphomas can be situated in the brain parenchyma, or they can be situated in the suparachnoid space. And uh, in that case, we call it a leptomeningeal lymphoma. The imaging appearance of leptomeningeal lymphoma is very similar to that of um, leptomeningeal metastasis, which we discussed in the last session. So today, I'm mainly going to show you parenchymal central nervous system lymphomas. Is there a difference between the imaging appearances of a lymphoma in patients with secondary lymphoma or patients with primary lymphoma, not that much. In the old days, it was often said that in a secondary central nervous system lymphoma, the lymphoma is predominantly located in the suparachnoid space. So it's mainly leptomeningeal. We now know that that is not completely correct. And secondary lymphoma, the tumor is mainly located in the brain parenchyma. It can be leptomeningeal and it can also be both. In primary central nervous system lymphoma, the tumor is mostly located in the brain parenchyma and there can be concomitant leptomeningeal disease. As I said, because leptomeningeal lymphoma looks exactly like uh, leptomeningeal metastasis, I will focus on lymphoma and the brain parenchyma. So for starters, what does a central nervous system lymphoma look like? This is an unenhanced CT of the brain in a patient with a central nervous system lymphoma. And what do we see? We see a tumor that is isodense compared to the cerebral cortex surrounded by hypodense edema. And this here, this increased density of the tumor is a very characteristic finding in central nervous system lymphoma. You can also see, see here, this is a tumor, and this is probably normal cerebral cortex, and the density is exactly the same. Uh, on this slide, you see several patients with central nervous system lymphomas. And don't forget, unenhanced CT is often the first imaging performed in patients with uh, tumors like this. They present to the ER because of a first seizure or because of a slowly developing or rapidly developing neurological deficit. And the first thing the emergency uh, room doctor does is order an unenhanced CT of the brain. And we see in each of these patients a tumor that is isodense or slightly hyperdense compared to the cerebral cortex. So we can actually discover and see these tumors on an enhanced CT of the brain. And that is not unimportant. Let's compare it with some of the other more frequent tumors in this age group. Glioblastomas, for instance. This is a glioblastoma. The tumor contains some dense, uh, dense components, which are probably hemorrhagic because glioblastomas often contain hemorrhagic components, but the tumor is mainly hypodense. The same is true for this glioblastoma that is completely hypodense. This is a bitalamic astrocytoma, and we see that the thalami are swollen and hypodense. And this is a patient with cerebral metastasis in which we can see the oedema associated with the metastasis, but we can't actually see the metastasis on this CT. So all in all, the fact that a CNS lymphoma is relatively dense on an unenhanced CT is a very characteristic finding. And why is that so important? Because if you report this and you say, the patient has a tumor surrounded by oedema, please do an MRI to find out what it is. You are correct. But then 
your uh, clinician will say, okay, the patient is symptomatic, has edema, let's start corticosteroids. It will reduce the edema and maybe it will reduce the symptoms of our patient. And a lot of these patients get started on corticosteroids. If the patient has a lymphoma, you don't want that because corticosteroids are lymphotoxic. They will kill the lymphocytes but not permanently. They will not eradicate the tumor completely. The tumor will recur, but they will kill it enough to cause a false negative biopsy. So you don't want these patients started on corticosteroids. So if you see a tumor like this, even if it's just on an unenhanced CT, you should say, beware, this could be central nervous system lymphoma, so your clinician will avoid or refrain from giving corticosteroids until he has secured a biopsy and occurred, procured a diagnosis in these patients. So and this is just everything I just said in text. Of course, not all dense tumors or lymphomas. This is a lymphoma. We can still have hemorrhagic metastases that are pretty dense on an enhanced CT. And this is a lymphoma, isodense compared to the brain parenchyma. And maybe this calcification here gives the diagnosis away. So an enhanced CT is not diagnostic, but if you see a tumor like this, you should nevertheless suggest the possibility of a potential central nervous system lymphoma. After you've done that, the patient will receive an MRI. MRI is very grateful, a very nice technique to diagnose central nervous system lymphomas because it's a tumor with very characteristic findings. And what are those? First of all, the tumor is, in a lot of cases, hypo-intense or iso-intense on T2 and flare images. Most tumors are hyperintense because they contain a lot of water, but not lymphomas. Secondly, the tumor is often homogeneously enhancing, while tumors like glioblastoma and cerebral metastasis often contain areas of necrosis. And lastly, the tumor is very often associated with diffusion restriction. We can see here an increased signal on the diffusion weighted images associated with the low signal on the ADC map. This is pathological diffusion restriction. Is, it, is a CNS lymphoma a solitary tumor or a multifocal tumor? It can be both. In the majority of cases, it will be one mass lesion, about 65% or 70%, but it can be multifocal in about one third of cases. So multifocality or uh, the, the tumor being a solitary tumor does say nothing about it being a CNS lymphoma or not. A very characteristic location for central nervous system lymphomas is the periventricular white matter. And these tumors love to crawl into the corpus callosum, which is also, as you remember from last session, a very fa uh, favorite position or a very favorite location of glioblastomas. This uh, are the images of three different patients, and we see these homogeneously enhancing sausage-shaped mass lesions all located in the corpus callosum extending from one hemisphere to the other, so-called butterfly lymphomas. Nevertheless, the differential with the glioblastoma is not that difficult because, as said repeatedly, these tumors are homogeneously enhancing, while glioblastomas will almost invariably contain areas of central necrosis. What is a further very characteristic finding of central nervous system lymphomas? That is the location. I already pointed out the periventricular location of tumors. Lymphomas are often located in the periventricular white matter, but not just there, also in the superficial brain parenchyma. And what is the what do these locations have in common? The tumor always lies in contact with a cerebral spinal fluid containing space. In this case, the tumor abuts the pile surface of the brain, so it contacts the place where the brain parenchyma lies in contact with the superacnoid space, as we see here in these two tumors, 
and in this case, the tumor contacts the ventricular surface. Why is a bit unclear, but CNS lymphomas are often located immediately adjacent to fluid-containing spaces, whether these are the superacnoid spaces or whether these are the ventricular system. Now, it's always interesting to be able to explain why a tumor looks the way it does. I've shown you three very characteristic features of lymphomas. They are dark anti-two-weighted images, they have diffusion restriction, and they show homogeneous enhancement. Why is that? Why do we see that? That is because lymphomas belong to a group of tumors called the uh, small blue round cell tumors. And what do these tumors have in common? Almost nothing. It is a very heterogeneous group of tumors that includes lymphoma, but also medulloblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, pineoblastoma, and a whole lot of other tumors. And the only thing these have in common with another is that when the pathologist takes a look under his microscope to examine them, they all are hypercellular and they all look like a whole bunch of very small cells compacted close together. And as a consequence, the intercellular spaces, the fluid containing spaces between the cells are very narrow. And this feature will determine the imaging appearance of the tumor. This is a schematic that shows you how you should imagine this. So we have a lot of small cells with a large nucleus and very small intercellular spaces compared to the normal brain parenchyma or other tumors that are not hypercellular. And as a consequence, there is not a, uh, not a lot of room for water molecules to move around in the intercellular spaces. Now, how does this lead to these imaging findings? The fact that the intercellular spaces are narrow means that there won't be a lot of interstitial fluid in the tumor. And because fluid causes uh, a hypodense uh, density on CT and a hyperintense signal on T2 weighted images, the fact that there is not a lot of fluid will make these tumors look hyperdense on CT and hypo-intense anti-two-weighted images. Furthermore, because there is not a lot of room in the intercellular spaces for the diffusion of water molecules, the tumor will be diffusion restrictive. Let's continue. What is another characteristic of these tumors pathologically? These tumors show a perivascular growth pattern. These are the blood vessels, and we see the tumors surrounding the blood vessels and growing along the blood vessels. That is one thing, but this growth along the blood vessels also damages the blood vessels. It induces apoptosis of the endothelial cells. As a consequence, the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, and when we give gadolinium or iodine to a patient with this tumor, the contrast will, of course, leak everywhere because there is no blood-brain barrier left, and we have very leaky vessels causing homogeneous contrast enhancement. What are other features of the tumor that can be helpful? The tumor has intense homogeneous enhancement, contrary to cerebral metastasis or glioblastomas that are often necrotic. I already told you that. But because of the bizarre growth pattern of the tumor along the blood vessels, the tumor is never round in shape or rarely round in shape because it doesn't grow the way a metastasis does. It grows in an infiltrative way. And we have very often notches along the margins of the tumor the so-called notch sign. This is something we will not encounter in a cerebral metastasis, for instance. Cerebral metastasis do not grow uh, infiltrative in the, infiltrati infiltratively in the brain parenchyma. You start with one a malignant cell that duplicates, and we get another duplication, and so on, and so on, causing the tumor often to be round or globular in shape. This is, of course, not 100% perfect, but in general, we can make that assumption. What is a further characteristic of lymphomas? 
the tumor is not associated with neoangiogenesis. Neoangiogenesis is the process in which a tumor develops blood vessels of its own to take care of its own blood supply. And we especially see this phenomenon in very malignant tumors like glioblastoma that need a lot of blood to survive. Lymphomas don't do that. And as a consequence, on a perfusion MRI, the tumor rarely shows hyperperfusion. It's always a tumor with hypoperfusion, a low perfusion, especially when we compare it to very hypervascular tumors like glioblastoma. Then I told you about the perivascular growth pattern of these tumors, and that is actually something we can also see in lymphomas. We see here a multifocal tumor, homogeneously contrast enhancing, with one lesion located along a ventricular surface in the corpus callosum. And when we take a close look, at this component of the lesion, we see a very branch-like pattern of enhancement. That is the tumor spreading along the blood vessels. That is actually a visualization of the perivascular growth pattern of central nervous system lymphomas. And, it's, and it is something we can also appreciate on these images here. Let's zoom in. Once again, we see a homogeneously enhancing mass lesion. It is multifocal. We have periventricular uh, lesions here and here. We have a notch sign, and we also have these very fine linear foci, foci of contrast enhancement. And these represent perivascular tumor spread and perivascular enhancement. And I already explained this. This is probably due to or a reflection of the growth of the tumor along blood vessels in the brain. In exceptional cases, because I think I've only seen this twice or so, the contrast enhancement can remain limited to the vascular walls. We get what is called a perivascular pattern of contrast enhancement. Take a look. This is the flare image. So we see diffuse flare signals signal changes in the periventricular and deep white matter, and they have somewhat a linear aspect. It's a quite bizarre appearance we have here. And if we compare that with the T1-weighted images after gadolinium, we see a linear pattern of contrast enhancement with these contrast enhancing lines radiating towards the ventricles. This reflects enhancement along the penetrating blood vessels in the brain parenchyma. It's a periventricular pattern of enhancement, and this can be seen in central nervous system lymphoma, although it is an exceptional finding because we don't have a mass-like lesion, uh, and that is something we see in the majority of cases. So we have no masses here. This is also an image with a very broad differential diagnosis. It is also a pattern you can see in neurosarcoid, for instance. You can also see it in uh, any kind of pathology that is associated with perivascular spread, for instance, uh, a cryptococcus meningitis, or in some very rare diseases like a GFA autoimmune encephalitis. So just keep it in mind that if you see this pattern in a patient, central nervous system lymphoma is part of the differential diagnosis. And you can explain that because of the perivascular growth pattern of lymphomas. What are pitfalls on imaging when it comes to lymphomas? This is a tumor with all the hall hallmarks of a central nervous system lymphoma. The tumor is dark on T2 and flare images. The tumor is associated with homogeneous contrast enhancement. There is some edema surrounding the tumor. Uh, that doesn't matter. The tumor has a periventricular location. It's a butterfly lesion. Everything is there, except why don't we see an increased signal on the diffusion-weighted images? There is no diffusion restriction, apparently. Does that mean it is not a lymphoma? Well, this is, I can't call it an artifact. This is a, a physical phenomenon called T2 blackout. As you know, diffusion-weighted images, uh, and diffusion-weighted images, the signal is based on two effects. The T2 effect, 
and true diffusion restriction. If you are dealing with a lesion that is very black on T2 weighted images, so very low signal on T2, this will predominate the diffusion image. The T2 effect will dominate over the diffusion effect and the lesion will appear normal or even dark on diffusion weighted images. And you will think, fun, oh, there's no diffusion restriction. Luckily, there's the ADC map. So you should always check your ADC map. The ADC map cancels out T2 effects and you only see diffusion restriction. Here we see that the lesion is pitch black on the ADC map. So this is true diffusion restriction and we just don't see it because of the T2 blackout effect. The T2 blackout effect is like a bit the reverse of the T2 shine true, which is better known, I believe. What is another pitfall? I said multiple times because I like repeating myself multiple times that lymphomas are generally homogeneously enhancing lesions and they have no areas of necrosis contrary to uh, glioblastomas or cerebral metastasis. Of course, there are always exceptions. In this patient, we see a multifocal tumoral process. We see lesions that are enhancing on T1-weighted images following gadolinium. Notice that a lot of the lesions make contact with the pial surface, so they contact cerebrospinal fluid containing spaces, the superacnoid space in this case. These lesions are associated with diffusion restriction. I did not show you the ADC map, but believe me, they were dark on ADC and they have an increased density on CT. So all the characteristics, characteristics of a central nervous system lymphoma are present except that we see areas of necrosis and multiple of these tumor hertz. How come? Well, because exceptions are always possible. You can have areas of necrosis and central nervous system lymphomas. It's just not that common, but not that rare either. It has been described in about 10 to 15% of central nervous system lymphomas in immunocompetent patients, which means patients with a normal immunity. In patients that are immunosuppressed, like HIV patients or patients who have undergone uh, a transplant, either a hematological or solid organ transplant, if those patients develop lymphomas, these lymphomas almost always contain areas of necrosis. They are just not that frequent immunosuppressed lymphomas compared to lymphomas in patients with a normal immunity. What you need to remember, you just have to keep in mind that if you see a tumor that looks like a lymphoma, the presence of necrosis does not mean you have to throw your diagnosis away. Necrosis is possible in lymphomas, although it's not common in patients with a normal immunity. Then a last pitfall, we see here a patient with a classical central nervous system lymphoma, homogeneously enhancing, black on ADC, so diffusion restrictive, low signal on T2, a classic butterfly lesion. But we also see a lot of T2 signal changes without enhancement and without diffusion restriction in the rest of the brain. And this is too extensive to be considered pedilesional edema. Because why would the patient have pedilesional edema and the frontal lobes if the tumor is situated here in the splenium of the corpus callosum? That does not make sense. This patient actually has two lymphoma patterns. Luckily for us, the patient has the classical sausage-shaped butterfly lesion in the splenium, which made the diagnosis from a radiological point of view, pretty easy and straightforward. But the patient also has a pattern that is called lymphomatosis cerebri. And what is lymphomatosis? Well, radiologically, it looks a bit like gliomatosis. It is diffuse, uh, diffuse infiltration of lymphoma in the brain parenchyma without uh, the formation of mass lesions. And these abnormalities can be associated with some patchy enhancement, but that's not absolutely necessary. 
They can be associated with diffusion restriction, but it's not necessary either. So it can be a tricky diagnosis, lymphomatosis cerebri. It's also not that frequent. So just remember this pattern and know that it exists and it is possible. And thank God in this patient to shorten the diagnosis, he had also a classical uh, lymphoma lesion. And the last pitfall, I've shown you a lot of cases, but histologically, these all belong to the same group of lymphomas and you have several groups. All the tumors I've shown you are so-called diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas. And these just are the most frequent. These account for about 85% of central nervous system lymphomas. So if you know this type, yeah, you know most of them. Then the second group are the so-called immunosuppressed lymphomas, which are seen in HIV patients. And I already told you lymphomas and these patients are mainly or often associated with necrosis. It makes them more difficult to diagnose because they look like opportunistic infections like toxoplasmosis or they look like classical cerebral metastasis. So the diagnosis is not easy and immunosuppressed lymphomas. And lastly, we have a very small group of other lymphomas, low-grade B-cell lymphomas, T-cell lymphomas, and so on. And these can look like anything. They are exceptionally rare, so there are no large cases in the literature. And this was a T-cell lymphoma. So most lymphomas I've shown you are B-cell lymphomas. This was a T-cell lymphoma, and it doesn't look anything like the lymphomas I've shown you. We have an irregular enhancing mass-like lesion without diffusion restriction surrounded by edema. The only clue we had to the diagnosis was the fact that the patient had another lesion in the scalp and that was already biopsied. And that was a so-called Cesare syndrome, a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So as a radiologist, we were a bit lazy and we just said, well, you have a lymphoma here you have a tumor here, we assume this is going to be lymphoma as well, and pathologically, that was the case. Of course, if it wouldn't, if it wouldn't have been for this lesion, this would have been a very difficult radiological diagnosis of a very rare central nervous system lymphoma. And this concludes the first part of today's session. We just had to talk a little bit about central nervous system lymphomas, because now you know the most frequent intraaxial brain tumors, which all happen to be malignant in the adult patient. You have seen cerebral metastasis, glioblastoma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and central nervous system lymphoma. And when should you consider central nervous system lymphoma? When you see a dense brain tumor on unenhanced CT, always dare to say this could be lymphoma to avoid the patient receiving corticosteroids, and when the patient has on MRI the very classical features of a hypo-intense tumor homogeneously enhancing with diffusion restriction, and when the lesion or the multiple lesion contact the CSF spaces, you see a notch shine or some branch-like enhancement, these are further arguments for CNS lymphoma that help you in your diagnosis. So that concludes malignant intraaxial brain tumors and adults. Let's get on with it because we still have a lot to cover. We have done the malignant brain tumors. We have talked about metastasis, but we still have this pretty large group, the benignant brain tumors, which include meningiomas, cellar tumors, and nerve sheet tumors. Let's start with meningiomas and nerve sheet tumors because these are extra axial brain tumors. What are extraaxial brain tumors? Brain tumors located outside the brain parenchyma. And in the last session, I told you if you see an intraaxial brain tumor in an adult patient, you have like 75% chance that it's going to be cerebral metastasis or glioblastoma. A similar rule can be applied for extraaxial brain tumors. If you see an extraaxial brain tumor in an adult patient, you have like 80% chance that the tumor is there either going to be meningioma 
or it's going to be a schwannoma. And meningioma is the most frequent of the two. And the differential between the two is actually very, very easy because, I've, of course, I'm now showing you two very old mini-like tumors, but meningiomas arise from the meninges, as the name implies, and they have a very broad dural base. Schwannomas arise from Schwann cells. Schwann cells are the cells responsible for the myelination of the cranial nerves and of the peripheral nerves and spinal nerves. So intracranially, we will only see schwannomas along cranial nerves. So if you see an extra axial lesion located along the course of a cranial nerve, and in about 90% of cases, that's going to be the vestibulocochlear nerve, voila, schwannoma, because what else could it be? Nevertheless, let's talk a bit more about meningiomas and schwannomas. The clue to diagnosing a meningioma on imaging is in an adult patient is determining with certainty that a tumor is located outside the brain parenchyma. If you can do that, you can be like almost sure or with like 80% 80 uh, 80 sure that it's going to be a meningioma. How can you do that? There are some tricks and the advanced radiologists will all know them, but there are also a lot of young residents uh, I've noticed that follow these sessions. So it doesn't hurt to repeat them once again. The most reliable sign is the presence of a small rim containing cerebrospinal fluid between the extra axial tumor and the brain parenchyma. And we call that the CSF cleft. And this is basically the superarachnoid space that is displaced. And because the superarachnoid space contains superarachnoid vessels, arteries, and veins, these are often displaced and located between the brain and the tumor. At the outer margins, we get some widening of the CSF cleft, and this is often called the CSF meniscus, and it looks a bit triangular, and that's why they call it the meniscus. And underneath the tumor, we often see cortex, which makes sense because the cerebral cortex is the most superficial part of the cerebral hemisphere. And if you have an extra axial tumor, it will flatten the cortex underneath the tumor. Then we have some signs that are less reliable, the dural tail sign, thickening and enhancement of the dura immediately adjacent to the extra axial tumor and bony changes. These can be erosions or these can be hyperostosis, increased bone formation. And here I've drawn hyperostosis because that is what we most frequently see in meningiomas. But these signs are less reliable than the CSF cleft. And this is a typical example of a CSF cleft. We see here a nice nodular lesion, a lesion and we see a T2 hyperintense rim separating the tumor from the brain parenchyma. We also see some widening here, a CSF meniscus, and we see a vessel located in the cleft between the brain and the tumor. We also see some cortex immediately underneath the tumor. So we have all characteristics of an extraaxial tumor. Look for the CSF cleft. The CSF cleft is the most reliable sign of an extraaxial tumor. Uh, so always try to see it. You can see it on any sequence. It's often most conspicuous on the two-weighted images, but you can see it on CT if you want and look for it. And if it's clear, of course, you can see it on flare images where its contents are often hyperintense because it's called a CSF cleft, but it is believed that it doesn't really contain cerebrospinal fluid, but more proteinaceous fluid, probably because the, it contains some fluid secreted by the tumor. That's just the hypothesis, but it's often hyperintense on flare. Um, anyways, just look for it, the CSF cleft. The dural tail sign is a bit less reliable. We see here two very nice examples. These are very small convexity meningiomas, homogeneously enhancing extra axial tumors. And we see some thickening and enhancement of the dura immediately adjacent to the tumor. Notice, and we see it best in this patient, that a dural tail often is more strongly enhancing than the tumor. 
this meningioma enhances, yes, but the tumor, there is a difference in signal intensity between the dura and the tumor. And this dural tail, it used to be believed that this was due to tumor invasion in the dura. That's not the case. The dural tail probably reflects congestive reactive changes in the dura and is not equal to tumor invasion of the dura. Uh, the dural tail can be very small, very limited, like in this patient, or can be very hyperextensive, extending a long way uh, along the left cerebral hemisphere in this patient. Dural tail signs are strongly associated with meningiomas. And of course, meningiomas are the tumors that most often have them, but not exclusively. Basically, any tumor that contacts the brain surface and the dura can be associated with a dural tail sign. This patient had a central necrotic intraaxial tumor. This was a glioblastoma, and this glioblastoma was located superficially in the brain parenchyma and contacted the dura, causing thickening and enhancement of the dura, giving rise to dural enhancement looking a lot like a dural tail. So keep in mind that a dural tail sign is not pathognomonic for meningioma. Just because you see a tumor with a dural tail does not mean the tumor is going to be meningioma. And you can see it even in intraaxial brain tumors. So it's not even a reliable sign to differentiate an intraaxial from an extraaxial tumor. Let's, uh, let's tell you some basic facts about meningiomas. What are they? Well, they are the most frequent primary brain tumor in adults and the most frequent extraaxial brain tumor in adults as well. It is typically a tumor of adult patients. Most patients are 40, uh, beyond their 40s, and it is rare in children. If you see it in young adults, you have to consider the possibility of a predisposing condition of which the most frequent will be neurofibromatosis type 2. Neurofibro neurofibromatosis type 2 is a genetic syndrome in which patients often develop multiple schwannomas, multiple meningiomas, and they can also develop ependymomas and often at a younger age. And meningiomas are very often an incidental finding on imaging. Only 10% are symptomatic when they are discovered. So we often pick them up on CTs of the brain because CT of the brain is often performed for various reasons. And can anyone see the tumor here? Well, it's a very large tumor. So I'm sure most of you picked it up, but it's not that easy because meningiomas tend to be isodense or slightly hyperdense compared to the brain parenchyma, especially the cerebral cortex, making them difficult to discover without uh, contrast administration or without contrast. When they receive contrast, the tumor is mostly homogeneously enhancing. Luckily, to discover them on CT, the tumors often, well, often in about 25 or 30% of cases may contain calcifications. And if it weren't for these calcifications, this very small isodense lesion, this very small meningioma would probably have been missed and understandably so, because it's almost impossible to detect. The same applies for this lesion here. Just look at the central tumor it is isodense, completely isodense compared to the brain. But luckily, the periphery of the tumor is calcified, making the tumor discoverable on this unenhanced CT of the brain. These calcifications and meningiomas can become very extensive. And when the tumor is completely calcified, it is sometimes called a burnt out meningioma under the assumption that the tumor, when it's completely calcified, cannot grow anymore. Some authors say you shouldn't do that because there are cases where these tumors still continue to grow, but I've never seen it, but I believe it's possible. Uh, 
Then the same applies for MRI. So meningiomas are often iso-dense compared to the brain and difficult to see when they're not that big on an enhanced CTs of the brain. The same applies to MRI. There is a meningioma somewhere on these images. Can anyone see it? Mm, I doubt it. And here it is. Following gadolinium administration, we see a homogeneously enhancing very small lesion, which can now be seen here on the T1 weighted images as iso intense compared to cortex and also iso intense compared to cortex on T2. So, very difficult to see if you don't give gadolinium to a patient. When the tumor is large, of course, it doesn't pose that much difficulties. And we here we have all the signs of a classic meningioma. We have a tumor that is clearly extra axial and has a very broad dural base. And that are the most important char characteristics. Uh, the tumors are often homogeneous on all sequences. There is often very intense contrast enhancement. Uh, very often these tumors are slightly diffusion restrictive, hmm, not very light bulb diffusion restrictive, but slightly. So there is some increased signal on diffusion, a little bit reduced on the ADC map, but there are always exceptions. And like I told you in the last session, when we were talking about cerebral metastasis, always keep in mind that an atypical imaging presentation of a frequent tumor is more likely than a typical presentation of a rare tumor. So the same applies to meningiomas. These are incredibly frequent. And although they generally are homogeneously enhancing, that's not always the case, like we see here in this meningioma located parasagittally, and here in this very large meningioma. These look more aggressive because they are not so homogeneously enhancing, but nevertheless, these were very benign WHO1 meningiomas. Uh, these meningiomas can sometimes contain cysts, very small cysts, like we see here, and another meningioma that was a WHO1 tumor, and small cysts can be seen in about 10 to 20 percent of tumors. Uh, morphologically, there are two subtypes. So most meningiomas I've shown you until yet look like this. Yeah, a tumor that's like semi-nodular with a very broad dural base and really as mass-like. Okay, but we have another morphological subtype that is not infrequent, and that is the so-called en plaque meningioma. En plaque comes from French, means plate-like, like a plate. And why is that? Because these tumors do not form masses, like we see here, but they tend to cause a sheet-like thickening of the dura. And these tumors are very often associated with a very extensive hyperostosis. So we see that the bone of the skull is very thick, and we also see some enhancement superficially of the thickened bone at the place where we see these on plaque meningiomas. These are not that frequent, but nevertheless make up maximum 10% of meningiomas. And you will encounter them in daily clinical practice. And the reason might be the hyperostosis, because I've seen several cases where patients received a CT of the brain, and the clinical information said, bump on the head, a hard bump on the head. Can't see anything with ultrasound. No, of course you can't because it's bone. It's very thick bone. And if you see this on an unenhanced CT of the brain, well, the first time you see it, you have no idea what this could be. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. If you see this, you, you should suggest an MRI because CT with contrast probably won't reveal the tumor because it's often very thin. You should... Re uh, you should suggest an MRI to discover an underlying en plaque meningioma. And this was the same patient. We see here the thickening of the skull on these T1 weighted images with gadolinium. And we see that the actual tumor is really very small. We see a sheet-like or drape-like enhancement and thickening of the dura at the region where the skull is thickest. And this was a meningioma, a very classic location 
for these on plaque meningiomas is the backside of the sphenoid wing. So this is the sphenoid wing. And this here is an abnormal sphenoid wing. It is hyperostotic. The bone is, has expands tremendously. It looks a bit aggressive. You could say, well, what is this? This looks like periostal reaction. This, look like, uh, this looks like a sunburst phenomenon. Is this a very malignant tumor? But if that is so, then why is there no central lysis here? So a bizarre appearance the first time you see it. Uh, very often, this causes narrowing of the intraorbital compartment and patients present with a slowly progressive uh, proptosis. And when you do an MRI in these patients, you see, you see the meningioma underneath the sphenoid wing. We see here thickening and contrast enhancement of the dura. And we can also appreciate the extensive hyperostosis here. This is an ont mini tumor. If you've seen one of those, you've seen them all. Another patient, almost identical. The reason to receive the CT was progressive proptosis, slowly developing. We see proptosis of the right eye. We see increased bone formation that looks aggressive. And on MRI, there was self-evidently, as expected, dural thickening because the patient had on plaque meningioma. <laughs> A hyperostosis can be very extensive, and some authors call these tumors intraosseous meningiomas. I prefer not to, because the term intraosseous meningiomas should be reserved for those very rare meningiomas that occur primarily and only in the bone. And those exist, but they are very rare. This is a tumor that has arisen in the dura and has infiltrated the overlying bone, but this infiltration is pretty limited. What we see here is mostly reactive bone formation. No one knows exactly what the mechanism is, but when the tumor infiltrates the Havirchen channels in the bone, for some strange reason, it induces massive bone formation here, and this extreme hyperostosis, which is often the reason patients receive imaging. So avoid the term, but I know a lot of people use it and it's a very hard battle to fight. And you could wonder why, is it that important? Probably not. So where can we see meningiomas? Self-evidently everywhere where there are meninges because it's a meningeal tumor. Where do meningiomas arise from exactly? We would expect it to be the dura mater, right? But that's not the case. Actually, meningiomas arise from cells of the arachnoid membrane, more specifically, so-called arachnoid cap cells. And what are arachnoid cap cells? Arachnoid cap cells are cells that can be found in the so-called arachnoid villi. And the arachnoid villi are small protrusions of the arachnoid membrane through the dura mater into venous structures and they allow the resorption of central uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the venous system. So where will we find meningiomas? Everywhere where we have arachnoid villi, which can be basically anywhere in the central nervous system, of course. The majority, 80 to 90%, are located supratentorially with classical locations along the cerebral convexities, along the falcs, uh, cerebri or parasagittally in the corner between the cerebral convexity and the uh, interhemispheric fissure. When you have a tumor in this location, always, always, always check your superior sagittal sinus. Why is that? Because meningiomas, despite the fact that the majority are very benign, have a tendency to infiltrate nearby venous structures. In this patient, we see a bifrontal falx meningioma uh, that has completely infiltrated the superior sagittal sinus. And this is important information for your neurosurgeon. It means that if the superior sagittal sinus is completely taken in by tumor, as we, oh, I was expecting to see an angiography here, as here, 
it is lost and he can sacrifice it and completely remove the tumor. If, however, the tumor compresses the superior sagittal sinus, but does not completely infiltrate and obliterate it, it is dangerous to sacrifice the superior sagittal sinus because the patient might develop a venous infarction uh, after the surgery. Most important, what we as radiologists should do, should do is determine if the tumor infiltrates a dural sinus, yes or no, and if the dural sinus still is patent, yes or no, still has signs of patency. So what are other locations supratentorially? Uh, the skull base. So classical locations are the olfactory groove, where we find olfactory groove meningiomas at the backside of the sphenoid wing, where we often find on plaque meningiomas, but we can also find globose meningiomas like here and uh, on the sphenoid plate, often extending in the supracellar cistern, and in this case, also compressing the pituitary. This is a so-called supracellar meningioma. These names are often used, olfactory groove meningioma, sphenoid wing meningioma, but they have nothing to do with the histology of the tumor. They are just uh, common denominators to describe where the tumor is located. About 10% of meningiomas can be found infratentorially, and this is a tricky one. I will tell you a little bit more about it later on or uh, uh, immediately. The so-called petroclival meningioma, a meningioma located against the backside of the clivus and the apex of the petrous bone, very often infiltrating the cavernous sinus. This is a cerebellopontine angle meningioma, so a meningioma and a cerebellopontine angle, self-evidently, a cerebellar convexity meningioma and a foramen magnum meningioma. So of these tumors, the petroclival meningiomas are very tricky tumors. And why is that? Because we have a lot of critical structures in that region. We have a lot of cranial nerves, we have a lot of vascular structures, and then we have a tumor there that infiltrates everything. And as a consequence, it's very difficult to remove surgically. So if you see a petroclival meningioma, what should you look for? Look for potential invasion of the cavernous sinus. Look if there is encasement and or narrowing of the internal carotid artery, as we see here, which already makes this tumor basically impossible to remove surgically. Look for invasion of Meckel's cave, as we see here. For a comparison, this is the contralateral normal Meckel's cave. So we see the tumor has extended into Meckel's cave, where we find the trigeminal ganglion or the gusser ganglion. And the tumor also extends into the prepontine cistern, and we can see here the basilar artery, which luckily is not encased by the tumor. Uh, when a petroclival meningioma invades the cavernous sinus, it will often encase the internal carotid artery and narrow it. Other tumors won't do that. If you have a schwannoma in that region, or you have a very large pituitary adenoma, that infiltrates the cavernous sinus, these tumors will not cause narrowing of the internal carotid artery. That is very characteristic for meningiomas. And we can also see here, compared to the other side, it's the same patient, that the internal carotid artery is narrowed in the cavernous segment because of the tumor. However, these stenoses are rarely hemodynamically relevant. So you can see some narrowing, but it will rarely cause uh, vascular incidence or strokes. And then we have various locations which are very infrequent. Less than 5% of meningiomas can be found in the pineal gland legion intraventricularly. However, if you see a meningioma, in the ventricles, it will always be located in plexus. Why is that? And why do we even get to have meningiomas in the ventricles? Because there is no, there is no arachnoid membrane, there is no dura mater in the ventricular system. So why is that? That is because the plexus contains cells that look a lot, but a lot, like the arachnoid cap cells of the arachnoid villi. And that is probably the reason why meningiomas can develop in the plexus choroideus. 
even more, despite the fact that intraventricular meningiomas are only like 1% of all meningiomas, they are the most frequent intraventricular, intraventricular tumor in the trigone in adults. So if you see a tumor in the trigone in an adult patient, the chances are high that it's going to be meningioma. And the same is true for spinal meningiomas, despite constituting like 1% or maximum 2% of all meningiomas, spinal meningiomas are the most common extramedullary, meaning arising outside of the milum, intradural spinal tumors. So what else can we tell you about meningiomas? The majority are benign, but that also means there are high-grade meningiomas, and the majority are sporadic, meaning patients have no predisposing genetic conditions or a predisposing history. So let's talk about the exceptions. Let's start with the sporadic meningiomas. When a meningioma is not sporadic, what are the causes? This is a patient with a very small, homogeneously enhancing uh, left parietal convexity meningioma. And this patient also has these contrast-enhancing lesions, which are located, I admit it's probably not so easy to see, but this is the internal auditory meatus. Yeah, and then here we see the cochlea. So these are located somewhere along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve or the facial nerve. You can't really figure it out on these images but these are very likely schwannomas. So what does this patient have? The patient has bilateral schwannomas and the meningioma. This is a patient with neurofibromatosis type two. Neurofibromatosis, I already told you, is a genetic syndrome caused by mutations in the neurofibromatosis type two gene associated with the development of multiple meningiomas, multiple schwannomas, even ependymomas, often in younger patients. So you should consider it when you see multiple meningiomas or schwannomas, especially in a young patient. This is a young girl, I think about 10 years old, who had a craniopharyngioma, uh, a cellar tumor, and we will talk about that a bit more later on. But for now, you just have to know that this tumor was not operated, operated upon, but was treated completely with radiation therapy. Okay, and successfully. 11 years later, patient receives a follow-up MRI that shows nothing out of the ordinary. And another two years later, wham, out of nothing, we see a very large homogeneously enhancing tumor. Uh, you can't really figure it out on these images, but this was an extra axial tumor, but with a very narrow dural base, one must say. The tumor was removed, and this was a meningioma. This patient was still in her early 20s, so that's very young for a sporadic meningioma. What was the cause here? The history of radiation therapy. Radiation therapy induces meningiomas, and meningiomas are the most frequent radiation-induced brain tumor. Very often, there is a very long latency period from like... 20 or even 30 years between radiation and the development of the meningioma, with the exception of younger patients. If a brain gets radiated upon during childhood or at an early age, these patients will develop meningiomas with a much shorter latency period like this patient did. Radiation-induced meningiomas are also more often high grade. This is another patient this patient also had a very large extraaxial mass lesion. If you look carefully, we can see some CSF cleft, but it's not everywhere very conspicuous, I must say, but you can also see it here, for instance, on these T1-weighted images. It is strongly enhancing, but not homogeneous, containing some areas of necrosis, apparently, and with some surrounding edema. This patient was in her 50s, but when she was like in her 20s or so, the patient had a pilocytic astrocytoma uh, in the posterior fossa that was treated with surgery and radiation therapy. And like 30 years later, she develops this tumor, 
which is very large, very ugly, was a meningioma. And this was another radiation-induced meningioma, and it was a higher grade. It was a so-called atypical meningioma, WHO grade 2. So what can we tell about meningioma grades? More than 90% of meningiomas or WHO1 tumors, meaning they are typical benign tumors. Five to 7% or WHO2 tumors, making them atypical meningiomas, and one to 3% or WHO3 tumors or anaplastic meningiomas, which are the most high grade or the highest grade. Now, is it possible for us as radiologists to predict the meningioma grade based on imaging features? For instance, edema. This is a patient with a spontaneously dense tumor with a lot of edema. Now, taking, in, taking into account what I said about lymphomas here, you might suggest from, hmm, this could be a lymphoma, but it wasn't. This was an extra axial tumor. And we see that the tumor is surrounded by a lot of blood vessels and contains some uh, flow voids. So this is a very vascular tumor that is very strongly enhancing and associated with a lot of edema. Is this a typical meningioma? Well, yeah, it was. This was a so-called angiomatous meningioma. Okay, it's not typical. It's a certain histological subtype that is often hypervascular, but it's still a benign subtype. So some of these subtypes in benign meningiomas can be associated with a lot of edema. So edema surrounding a meningioma is not a reliable sign of malignancy because you can see it in benign meningiomas. For example, this, this patient, we see an extra axial tumor homogeneously enhancing nice doodle tail, but a lot of edema, really a lot. Was this a high-grade tumor? No, it wasn't. This was a so-called secretary, uh, secretory, uh, I mean, meningioma, which is also very benign. These patients, on the other hand, all had higher grade meningiomas, WHO2, anaplastic, once again, WHO2, and the edema is actually quite limited. Here there is some, but not as much as we see, as we saw in the previous tumors. What do these tumors have in common? It's hard to say, but let's say our gut says, Van, ugh, they're ugly, they're big and ugly. Can we use that, even though it doesn't really sound very scientific -y? Well, maybe a bit, but you should be careful because this tumor is big and ugly as well, heterogeneously enhancing. And what was it? It was a fibrous meningioma, a subtype that is benign, WHO1. And this tumor, which looks like a benign tumor because it's very homogeneous, we see a nice CSF cleft, we see homogeneous enhancement, no edema. Well, surprise, surprise, this was an anaplastic meningioma. In the end, is it possible to predict meningioma grade based on imaging? No. Simple as that. Your gut feeling can tell you, Van, hmm, this looks like an ugly tumor. Well, don't worry about it. If it looks ugly, the neurosurgeon will probably perform a biopsy anyways. So you don't really have to speak out on whether you believe it's going to be high grade or not. If a tumor is small and beautiful, what is done? It's very often followed up in time, yeah? And year after year, the patient receives an MRI and each time the report says no change, no change, no change, but be careful. Meningiomas are very slow growing tumors, the benign meningiomas. But if you look on the long term, you can often see some growth. So always compare with multiple prior investigations. Meningiomas grow very slowly, but nevertheless, they grow. And it's just a bit silly. I don't think anything bad happened to this patient because uh, it was refrained to operate the patient for 10 years or so. But it's just a bit silly if you look at the first MRI and the last to read in every report that the tumor is unchanged. So let's talk about the differential diagnosis of meningiomas. When is it most likely a meningioma? Well, in the majority of cases, but in what instances should you suspect something else? 
Let's go back to this patient. This patient had a very small lesion. And I told you, oh, it's a meningioma. But how can I be sure? Because the oncologist called me and said, well, well you probably didn't know, but this patient has breast cancer. Couldn't this be a dural metastasis? Can I solve that problem for the oncologist? Well, I can't. I'm pretty sure that there are publications out there that say, well, with MRI spectroscopy and MRI perfusion, but to be honest, there is no radiological sign that is 100% reliable to differentiate between a small meningioma or a very small dural metastasis at such an early stage. The only thing you can do is say, well, let's just follow it up. If it's a dural metastasis, it's high grade, it's going to grow rapidly. Do another MRI in like three months or so or earlier if the patient develops symptoms. We did an MRI five months later, lesion unchanged. So we said, well, lesion didn't change. We do another MRI in a year or so, but this is very likely a meningioma and not a dural metastasis. Another patient, this was a patient with a glioblastoma. I'm not showing you the glioblastoma, but the patient also had a very small enhancing extraaxial lesion anteriorly of the right temporal pole. What did we say? Well, probably an incidental meningioma, an incidental finding. It is, after all, the most frequent primary brain tumor, right? So it's possible, but the patient had a glioblastoma. So every two to three months, he receives another MRI and we see growth and we see a lot of growth, and we see central necrosis. And this was a dural metastasis of a glioblastoma, which is exceptional. So basically the only characteristic that helped us change our diagnosis was the detection of growth of this tumor in a very short time. Uh, dural metastasis or often, often local extensions of skeletal metastasis in the dura. So if you see anything that resembles bony metastasis in the skull next to the dural tumor, well, then you can say, well, okay, this is going to be dural metastasis, like in this patient with prostata carcinoma and diffuse blastic skull metastasis. But in this patient, it's more difficult, of course. This was a patient with a thyroid carcinoma, has multiple uh, extraaxial lesions, all located along the falcs. And to be really honest, if you show this image without providing any further information, it's impossible to say whether or not this could be multiple meningiomas, for instance, in a patient with meningiomatosis or neurofibromatosis type 2 or dural metastasis. Here we said, well, the patient has a thyroid carcinoma, so it's very unlikely that we see multiple meningiomas in a patient with thyroid carcinoma, and these were by a um, pathologically proven dural metastasis. There's one final differential diagnosis I want to show you. It's a very rare tumor, but you might encounter it uh, in the course of your career. We see a very large tumor extending through the skull, causing complete lytic destruction of the occipital bone here. And the tumor comes from within the cranium and extends uh, throughout the skull defect and the subcutaneous tissues. It's a very vascular tumor we see on this contrast enhanced CT with gadolinium and it contains some small calcifications. This tumor is very strongly enhancing and contains several flow voids. It's also inhomogeneous on T2-weighted images. What is it? This is a tumor that used to be called hemangiopericytoma, but is now called solitary fibrous tumor of the dura of a higher grade. Oh, very nice. I see some people are uh, trying to guess what it is. Yeah, very right. Hemangiopericytoma, but the name has changed to solitary fibrous tumor of dura. What are these tumors? These belong to the mesenchymal tumors. What are mesenchymal tumors? Mesenchymal tumors are tumors that derive from mesodermal elements like connective tissue, vascular structures, and so on. Uh, and what is characteristic for solitary fibrous tumors of Dura? Well, first of all, they're very rare. Patients are generally middle-aged, 50s, 60s, they can be completely benign, but they can also be anaplastic, WHO3. Uh, 
Uh, the high-grade form used to be called hemangioparasitomas, and these are very aggressive because they can metastasize. They can cause lung metastasis or skull metastasis, so it's not a tumor you want to miss. Unfortunately, the tumor can look a lot like meningiomas. What are characteristics that will help you recognize them? Well, the pattern of growth because this tumor was followed up and here it was suggested from this is a meningioma, but I had my doubts because what is a bit strange for a meningioma is the tumor has a very narrow dural base and grows a lot towards the brain. So it is actually, how do you call that, taller than wide, which is very bizarre for a meningioma. This growth pattern is also called mushrooming because it looks a bit like a mushroom if you use your fantasy. It looks as if the tumor has a very narrow stalk and then grows and thickens more in the height of the tumor. Yeah, you need your imagination a bit, but you know what I mean, I hope. So this is bizarre, you know, the narrow dural base. And this was a solitary fibrous tumor of dura. What are other characteristics? These tumors are often inhomogeneous on the two-weighted images because they contain collagen, and collagen is dark on the two-weighted images. This gives rise to the so-called yin-yang phenomenon, as we can see here. We see an extra-axial tumor, we see a CSF cleft, but the signal intensity is mixed areas of high and low signal. We also see mushrooming, so the very bizarre growth pattern of the tumor, and the tumor has a very narrow dural base compared to the height of the tumor. And lastly, once again, we see the low T2 signal caused by collagen in the tumor. So when should you think solitary fibrous tumor of the dura? When a tumor is extra axial, your first idea is it's an extra axial tumor. It's going to be meningioma, but the tumor has mixed high and low signal, a so-called yin-yang phenomenon, a narrow dural base, a bizarre growth pattern that can be described as mushrooming. And especially when we're dealing with a higher grade solitary fibrous tumor, the, the kind that used to be called hemangioparasitomas, we can see lytic skull involvement, meningiomas, or mostly associated with hyperostosis, not with skull lysis, and we can see flow voids in the tumor and very intense enhancement because it's hypervascular tumor. The collagen-rich tumors are generally low grade and the hypervascular tumors with erosions are generally a higher grade. So then there's a last differential diagnosis to make, and that is a very specific differential diagnosis of a meningioma located in the cerebellopontine angle, like here. This tumor has a very broad dural attachment, which is characteristic for meningioma because they arise from the dura and grows outwardly. This tumor does not have uh, a broad dural attachment. We see a tumor that is located concentrically in the cerebellopontine angle region. And if we draw an imaginary line where we expect the vestibulocochlear nerve to be, we can assume that the tumor has developed along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve. This tumor also contains some small areas of necrosis, which is typical for very large vestibular schwannomas. So the differential diagnosis is between meningioma and schwannoma for cerebellopontine angle tumors. Schwannomas are also the most frequent tumor of the two. <clears throat> uh, now let's continue, and this is going to be the last topic for today, with a short session on schwannomas. So schwannomas are the second most frequent primary extraaxial brain tumor in adults, arise from the Schwann cell, so will develop along cranial nerves and peripheral nerves, mostly seen in adults, typically between 20 and 60 years of age, and when it comes to the intracranial schwannomas, 90% are located along the vestibular nerve. This makes them the most frequent cerebellopontine angle tumor, and they are a lot more frequent than meningiomas in this region. And they are mostly sporadic. And when you see multiple of them, think neurofibromatosis type 2. 
what is the typical uh, symptomatology of a patient with vestibular schwannoma? Well, either they are an incidental finding in an asymptomatic patient or the patient presents with progressive neurosensorial hearing loss, which can be quite abrupt. See? It can be very sudden. Uh, other signs are tinnitus and vertigo. The tumor is often enhancing, but here there is homogeneous enhancement. In larger tumors, there are often cysts and necrosis, and the tumor is often heterogeneously hyperintense on the two weighted images. This is another example. Here we see areas of necrosis, and although this looks aggressive, it is a very benign tumor, so this appearance should not worry you. And we see a very typical location in the cerebellopontine angle with a very heterogeneous signal on T2. This tumor develops along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve, mostly along the uh, vestibular division of the vestibulocochlear nerve, and it can be a very small nodule. It can be a larger nodule. The tumors typically uh, or mostly arise inside the internal auditory canal, as we see here, and then we call them intracanalicular, but they can extend into the cerebellopontine angle. As we see here, this tumor has an intracanalicular and a cerebellopontine angle component, or they may be solely located in the cerebellopontine angle, which is more exceptional. Um, this is something you should remember. If you see bilateral schwannomas, this is a virtually pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis type 2. And like 90% of schwannomas in the brain or along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve, if in patients with neurofibromatosis type 2, they can also be seen along other cranial nerves. But every now and then, you will see a schwannoma, a sporadic schwannoma, that is not vestibulocochlear. What are two of the more frequent ones? The jugular schwannoma and the trigeminal schwannoma. These are very large tumors. They contain areas of central necrosis. And the main clue to the diagnosis is the fact that they are extra axial and that you can locate them along the course of a cranial nerve. At first sight, you might say, Van, hmm, this is a bit more difficult here, but not really. Use the finger sign. Uh, if you put your finger in the center of the tumor, what do you find there? If we do that here, in this very ugly central necrotic tumor, hyperintense on T2, well, that's Meckel's cave we find there. What do we have in Meckel's cave? Nothing much. We just have dura and we have the, ner the trigeminal nerve. If it would be a meningioma, we would expect the tumor to be homogeneously enhancing. Central necrosis is typical for schwannomas, especially large schwannomas, so we conclude that it is most likely a trigeminal schwannoma. You can use the finger trick in larger tumors as well. Put your finger here. What do you have in the center of the tumor? The jugular foramen, which we can see here on the other side. And what do we have there? The jugular vein and the glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory nerve. So this is a jugular schwannoma. And this was a very huge trigeminal schwannoma <laughs> because if you look at the contralateral side, this is the course of the trigeminal nerve to the Meckel's cave. If we draw an imaginary line, of course, I had the luxury of being able to look at all the images. We see that this tumor has grown along the course of the trigeminal nerve into the Meckel's cave, which we can see here normally on the other side. So I am almost finished. So I am going to finish my session on cellar tumors, and that will be very short and very brief. Uh, what is the differential diagnosis of tumors located in the cella tursica? Well, there are three important ones. Cellar tumors will arise either from structures in the cella tursica, which is the pituitary, or from structures surrounding it, which include meninges of the cavernous sinus or located on top of the sphenoid plate, as we see here. So, the main differential diagnosis of a cellar and supracellar tumor in an adult patient includes meningioma, macroadenoma, and craniopharyngioma. And the distinction is not that difficult. Let's start with the meningioma. Let's examine this, this tumor 
carefully, what do we see on an unenhanced CT of the brain? The tumor has not arisen from the pituitary. The tumor has extended into the cella on top of the pituitary and compressed the pituitary. So you should always try to determine the point of origin of a tumor. And in this case, the point of origin is not the pituitary, and it is not even the pituitary stalk. It was the dura overlying the sphenoid plate, and the tumor has grown into the cella turcica and compressed the pituitary. Uh, what are primary tumors arising from the cella? Well, tumors can arise from the different components of the pituitary. We have the anterior pituitary, the pituitary stalk, and the posterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary tumors exist, but are very rare, so I will not cover them. And when it comes to the anterior pituitary, the primary tumor arising from the anterior pituitary is pituitary adenoma. The primary tumor arising from the pituitary stalk is craniopharyngioma. What are pituitary adenomas? They are very slow-growing benign tumors of the anterior pituitary that can be seen in adults and in children, but mainly in adults. They can be incidental findings, they can be associated with hormonological disturbances, or they can cause a mass effect. And they can be very small, in that case we call them microadenomas, or very large macroadenomas. They can be functioning, meaning they secrete hormones and cause endocrinological symptoms and disturbances, or non-functioning. And when it comes to the endocrine activity, most or prolactinomas, tumor secreting prolactin. Uh, this is an uh, example of a microadenoma. These tumors are on T1 weighted images following gadolinium, hypocaptating, meaning they enhance less compared to the normal pituitary gland, and microadenomas are, per definition, smaller than one centimeter. Most microadenomas are functional, and why is that? Well, because the patient received an MRI of the pituitary because he had endocrinological disturbances. These are too small to be detected incidentally. So you have to do a dedicated MRI of the pituitary, and you only do that if a patient is symptomatic. So as a consequence, most microadenomas are functional adenomas. Macroadenomas, very large adenomas, are non-functional, and that makes sense too. These patients did never develop endocrinological disturbances, and they only consulted a doctor when the tumor had grown so big that it started to compress the surrounding structures and cause symptoms due to mass effect. So macroadenomas larger than one centimeter. This is the finger rule. We see a tumor that has grown centrally in the cella turcica and extended supracellarly. And when we look at these tumors in the coronal plane, so the tumor has originated in the cella, very often we can no longer see the pituitary gland, which is the point of origin of the tumor, and where the tumor extends to the diaphragma cellae and to the supracellar cistern, we often see an impression making the tumor look a bit like a snowman in the coronal plane. Above the tumor, we can see the small plate of the optic chiasm, which is compressed by the tumor, and this causes very often uh, bitemporal hemianopia. Located alongside the tumor, we see the cavernous sinuses here. We see the internal carotid arteries here which are located in the cavernous sinus. And then the question is, is there invasion of the cavernous sinus by the tumor or not? In most cases, it's not. This is often reported, but very often it's just a little bit of bulging of the tumor onto the walls of the cavernous sinus, but no invasion. How can you tell if a tumor is really invading the cavernous sinus or just bulging along the wall a bit. There is a scale or a classification called the CNOS classification. And what do you need to do? Well, I simplified it a bit for you. You need to draw a line along the lateral margins of the internal carotid artery. Let's do that on the other side as well. And when the macroadenoma extends all the way to this line, but not beyond this line, there is like maximum 10% chance of the tumor invading the cavernous sinus. 
if the tumor extends above the internal carotid artery beyond this lateral line, there is 25% chance of cavernous sinus invasion. If the tumor extends below the internal carotid artery, beyond the lateral line, 70%, and when there is encasement, 100%. So there is only one situation in which there is 100% chance of the tumor completely invading the cavernous sinus, and that is when there is complete encasement of the internal carotid artery. Most pituitary adenomas are benign, but they can be infiltrative, like here. Here there is tumor extension into the clivus. There is tumor extension into the sphenoid sinus. There is extension into the cavernous sinus, but no encasement. So it's probably not infiltrating or invading the cavernous sinus, just extending a bit towards. And there is optic chiasm compression. So the final tumor of today is the craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngiomas arise from the pituitary stalk. They are located supracellarly, but my, might extend into the cella tursica, but very often we can still discern the normal pituitary. These tumors are located along the pituitary stalk. So when you draw an imaginary line, you can kind of guess where the pituitary stalk is. We have two types. We have a type that contains cysts and calcifications, and this is called the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. And then we have a second type, which is completely solid and mostly does not contain calcifications. This is the papillary craniopharyngioma. Both types can be seen in adults, but the papillary subtype will only be seen in adults and never in children. What can we say about craniopharyngiomas shortly? These are benign tumors. They are almost always located supracellarly, but they might extend into the cella tursica. They can be seen in children as well as in adults. There are two subtypes. It is the most frequent cellar tumor in children. And the tumor seen in children is exclusively the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. This can also be seen in adults. The papillary subtype, on the other hand, the solid enhancing mass is only seen in adults. And this is a classical example of an adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma in a child. We see a very large kystic supracellar tumor with cellar extension. The pituitary is difficult to see on these images. This is a CT and we see a large kist containing coarse calcifications. There is a 90% rule that says 90% of adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas contain cysts and 90% contain calcifications. So this is a recurring finding. This is the CT image. We see some peripheral calcification and we see that the cyst content is hyperintense on flare and T1 due to the presence of proteinaceous fluid. The previous patient was a child, but this is a very similar tumor. We see a multi-lobulated, multi-kystic process, supracellarly, a normal pituitary located inferiorly from the tumor in an older patient. This was also an adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. And then the last case of today is our papillary craniopharyngioma in a somewhat older patient, well, 47 is not that old, but okay. We see a solid enhancing mass. We see a normal, somewhat flat pituitary, a mass that has arisen from the pituitary stalk and contains no calcifications on unenhanced CT of the brain. And that concludes our session of today in which we covered a lot, I believe, and maybe a bit too much, but it's always choosing between should I show a lot or not. What have we seen? We have seen extra axial brain tumors, meningiomas and schwannomas in great detail, I believe. And I think you are now, in so far as you weren't already able to differentiate the two. When you see an extra axial brain tumor in an adult, there's 80% chance it's going to be meningioma or schwannoma, and the differential is not that different. Uh, difficult meningiomas have a broad dual pace, and schwannomas are located along a cranial nerve. When it comes to cellar tumors, 
try to figure out the point of origin of the tumor. If it's a tumor that seems to originate from the cella, from the anterior pituitary, it's an adenoma. If it originates from the pituitary stalk, it's a craniopharyngioma. And craniopharyngiomas in adults can be kystic or completely solid. So it 